Okay, so uh, I just want to share with you, we're going to go to Matthew 25, if you've got your Bibles. Do you love the Word of God? It's powerful, right? You know, a lot of what we are seeing today is wonderful parallels that we actually read through the pages of this most incredible living book. And, uh, you know, in the early church, they used to give time to the reading out of Scripture just reading it out. In fact, Jacob did a beautiful job of that a few weeks ago where he had a scripture about ask, seek and knock. And he didn't give any word off the back of it. He just read the scripture and let the scripture be the prophetic word in of itself. And I think sometimes we need to get back to a pure love for the word not because we want to be intellectually informed, but we know that it is alive, it's active and it cuts right into the very core of who we are, even discerns the the thoughts of our hearts. That's why we need the word of God. And so we have a huge value for worship, but equally um, the word reveals the word, Jesus himself. And so we're going to spend a bit of time in Matthew 25. Before we get there, just to give a bit of context to what has been happening in the last few weeks, the Lord has been uh, aligning this house to think as he thinks with two main focuses. The first one is a hunger and a commitment to the harvest you see we can do the bless me thing and have our bodies healed and just enjoy the christian walk and enjoy our bubble because we can easily create a bubble and actually a city go to hell you don't hear hell being preached about very often but the reality is if you don't have the gospel you don't commit to the gospel that's where people end up and it's a burden of the lord's heart that none should perish and if we are you uh, united with it and aligned with him, what matters to him becomes a matter of the heart for us. And so the very last commission that he gives them, isn't it, is to basically go into the harvest. It's about preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand and you have the full assurance that signs, wonders and miracles will follow. And we see this in the book of Acts where it says that they decreed the name of Jesus and he was the one who stretched out his arm and wrought great miracles. Uh, all we have to do is decree the kingdom of God is at hand. All we have to do is speak about this one who has the name above every name, King Jesus. And I believe the Lord is looking at uh, refilling the church again with a boldness that actually brings breakthrough. I believe it because the Lord longs to restore his lost sons and daughters and we all know what it is to be lost you know and if you've never given your life to Christ tonight could be the night where you leave knowing that you are fully right before the Lord because he paid for your sins you no longer have to have the same issues and the same cycles that he can make you afresh and new and that you actually step onto the page for the reason why you're alive you were created for good works before the foundation of the world. The gospel is truly good news. What do you need to do for it? Nothing. Just say yes to it. Beautiful. And so it's this message that we're going to be taking out into the city. And that's an eternal perspective. The harvest, the salvation of souls is intrinsically linked to the second focus that we have, which is the return of Christ. Jesus will not return until the fullness of the harvest has come in. And in fact, actually, we think that it's just all on eternity's side. But actually, there is a responsibility as us, as outposts of the kingdom of God, as being the visible Jesus. That's what you are as a Christian, a little anointed one. It is your job to reveal the kingdom that you now belong to because you no longer belong to the world. You are dead and alive in Christ if you've accepted him. Therefore, you are governed by a different kingdom than the one that you see in the world around you. That means that when the next pandemic hits, you do not have to come under the curse of that pandemic. You can live in the blessing and the fruitfulness of a greater kingdom that has no pandemic. Some people's businesses will shut down in the world, but actually you belong to a kingdom whose resource is a mammon, but actually is the Lord who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. So he is shifting this house to begin to think from the realm of eternity because you are already in eternity because Ephesians tells us you've been raised up in Christ Jesus and seated with him in heavenly places. 
nothing of the world can exist there but everything of his world can exist here that's why we've been called to pray your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and so 2 peter 3 12 tells us we have our, a responsibility he says here he says looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the lord we are to look for his return those churches who have an eternal mindset grow very very quickly because in that type of teaching and preaching people realize that this short breath of a life is just that it's a vapor that is taken away by the wind but it's an invitation for your life to be a seed that will have eternal ramifications you have the most wonderful invitation to bring fruitfulness to jesus wow to cast a crown before his feet. I, I don't think we I don't think we understand what that moment will be like that you will actually get to lay down the crown before the Lord. And I think we need a deeper revelation of what it is for Jesus to be returning and for us to be united with him, to see him clearly and to see him rightly. But we are to look and to hasten. How do we hasten the return of the Lord? We commit to what's important to him. We're going to go out and get the harvest. And so a promise on this house is that the Lord has called us to see a city baptized. That means they come to see Jesus for who he is. And they're going to go through the waters where their old man is left in the grave and they're going to be resurrected into new life. That's the call on this house. Ultimately, and we do it through worship. We do it through encountering him as individuals, as a corporate family, but also as a regional encounter where the Lord's glory rests over a region. Can he do that? Well, he's been doing it all over the world in every generation. So he's going to do it here. Amen. Is that exciting? So this is uh, feeding into what I want to talk to you about today in terms of the return of the Lord. I spent a bit of time talking about the harvest, but I really want to anchor our perspective on living as though Jesus can return tomorrow. See, some people say, well, and um, we were talking about it earlier today. Some people say, well, this is going to happen. This is going to this is going to happen as if any biblical prophecy that we've ever read, we've ever been able to guess right. OK, so sometimes the Lord has actually fulfilled prophetic words in the scripture. And we're still waiting for the fulfillment because it doesn't look how we expected it to look. That's why they killed Jesus. They're Jews even now don't even think there was his Messiah. And thankfully, the eyes, the veil, the scales are falling off them and they're seeing him rightly. But there is going to come a time in the future when the fullness of the Gentiles, that's me and you, non-Jewish people, the fullness of that harvest comes in. And then the Jewish people will come back in, be grafted into the tree that is the family of God. And I just really believe that it's such a, a key focus for us. But all of this, we have signs to look for, even if they're not prescriptive, you know, and I just want to set the scene for uh, chapter 25 by just very quickly recapping chapter 24. It's going to get hard. OK, so that's the summary. Uh, there's going to be rumours of wars. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be famines. There's going to be shakings and rumblings. And the Lord actually says to the disciples before he gets to chapter 25, these are just birth pains birth pains and you know what it's like women you know if you're giving birth to something you know it you can feel the pains coming and sometimes they can be days some people's labors are really long others it seems to be as soon as it starts and then the baby is out we don't know how long it's going to be but what we can do is is put our finger on what the world looks like today and we can clock actually we are closer to the return of the lord than you've ever realized and so the chapter 24, focusing on the coming of man, one of the key ideas about that, Jesus said, as in the days of Noah. You see, the Lord sent a flood in the days of Noah because the world was so given over to the kingdom of darkness with all of its appetites, the flesh being its very own God, that they actually came to a point where they couldn't repent. And if you look at the world today, you could quite easily argue that the world is heading in the devil's direction, not in the Lord's direction. So not only is there rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines, which we've been seeing for generations. But if you look at the breakdown of godly values, for example, family, 
breaking down, you can see that actually we are accelerating incredibly quickly to the moment that the Lord is going to return. And so Matthew 25 is meant, uh, 24 isn't meant to be a checklist. All oh, right, we've seen this, we've seen this, we've seen this. He's coming tomorrow. He's just describing the environment, the atmosphere of the earth and the world for when he does actually come in. So when you look at the world today, how does it make you feel? Does it make you feel anxious? Does it make you feel like the world's going to hell in a handbasket? Or does it make you full of joy knowing that light shines brightest when it gets darkest? What is your heart response? Because the promise of Isaiah 60 is arise and shine for your light has come. And even though deep darkness covers the earth, you're still going to shine even brighter. So we should, if we have prophetic eyes to see from the Lord's perspective, see that this is the greatest opportunity the church has ever had to see the kingdom of God come and break cities wide open. And is it hard for the Lord? Nothing's too hard for him. And whether it is by many or by few, a word over the house, he is able to give the victory. But it starts off with, can you see what he wants to do? Can you see what is possible? We are living for the harvest and we're living for his return. The two are hand in hand, two sides of the same coin. So that is chapter 24 in a nutshell. Let's go to chapter 25. I'm going to read through it and I'm just going to pick some thoughts out for us. Would somebody just be able to ping the lights on at the back for us? These little headlights for us. It's quite hard to read my Bible. Thanks, Lauren. So let's read this together. Then the kingdom of heaven starts off with then. What does that mean? Everything that's gone on before, him describing it as in the days of Noah, rumors of wars, famines, etc. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Oh, yes. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins, so the wise and the foolish, arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Okay, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would just open the ears and eyes of our heart, that we would see what is your heartbeat for this hour. I pray right now, Father, that people would hear more than what is actually being spoken, but you would just minister to the very depths of who we are. And I pray, Father, in that place, true destiny is unlocked, that we'll be able to reveal Jesus as you've truly called us. Amen. OK, I just want to pull some thoughts out of here um, and anchor us in this perspective of being a people who look for the return of Jesus. And so it says, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins. Now, this is a wedding picture that's actually happening here. And in terms of Jewish culture, um, the bridal party usually was ten people. So Jesus is intentionally targeting a Jewish understanding about a wedding and he's setting the scene about a wedding because in Revelation we know that when Jesus returns we're actually going to be ushered into the great wedding feast and actually he is going to be serving the tables that's incredible to think that the creator himself is still serving the created at his own wedding and so the church itself is not just the body of Christ. It's not just a community, not just a family, it's all those things. But it's actually known as the bride of the lamb in the book of Revelation. 
And on that point there, the Lamb, Jesus' name that is echoed through heaven isn't great King. It isn't great healer. It isn't great deliverer. He is known as the Lamb who was slain. The greatest revelation you can have of Jesus is that he died on the cross for you, that he defeated sin and death, and he was resurrected, leading captivity captive, and he humiliated, humiliated the enemy with all the consequences of sin. Think of your sickness. Think of your oppression. Think of the poverty. He humiliated them all. And then he was raised up to a seat that was above every other name and given a name that's above every name. That is who heaven knows is Jesus. And that is the Jesus that is walking with us. And right now, Jesus is in this room. And if you have the eyes to see, we would be able to align with him because he said, when two gather in my name, I am there present with him. And he's present with us by the Holy Spirit, who is known as the Spirit of Christ. Everything that Jesus is, the Holy Spirit is. Everything that Jesus is, the Father is. It's the three in one. So we have these 10 virgins, 10 being the bridal company. Virgins is the picture of purity. Those who have received Jesus, those who've had their sins absolutely cleansed, washed free, they are now spotless and blameless and pure before the Lord. And so Jesus is setting the context on who he's actually talking to. He is not talking to the unsaved. He's talking for a the people who have been redeemed by his blood, because nothing can make you clean apart from the blood of Jesus. You know, those old songs is like his crimson flow has washed me white as snow. Remember that old school song? That is the truth of the power of the blood. So Jesus is talking about the redeemed. That's you and me. If you've accepted the Lord Jesus as your savior and Lord. So these 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, the lamps here is not just for their sight, you know, to be able to lead them, but actually is an expression of their ministry. So remember, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. But then he turned and said, now you are the light of the world. And he says, you don't put a lamp under a bushel, but it sits on the top of a hill. What's he saying? Your ministry, your expression of who I am and my kingdom through you should be shining bright in front of the whole world. Now, as a clarification, ministry has got nothing to do with this. Ministry is about you walking with the Lord day in, day out. So when you are at your workplace, you are in the right place at the right time to release who Jesus is and the reality of his kingdom. That's your ministry. That's your lamp. When you're with your family and you are discipling your children, that is more important than me teaching you right here, right now, because that's the ministry still. And so the Lord doesn't see the church as the call to ministry, even though that's what we've made it. But actually, the majority of the harvest is going to be taken in, not by hiding in this building, but by us going out into the world and modeling Jesus as he calls us to do. Because he says, as I am, so are you going to be in the world. Do the same works as I do and even greater. And so there's a real call for us to be salt and light. Salt infiltrates light illuminates and so we've been called to illuminate the kingdom of God where it's getting darker and darker and I always look for where the darkest things are because I think that's where the greatest testimonies are you know I put a candle on here you're going to see it but won't have any impact at all then it uh, doesn't compare sorry to me being here at three o'clock in the morning with all the lights out I'm going to enjoy the candle much more on my own in the dark three in the morning and so the light has been created to go into the dark and the darkness cannot prevail against it that's a beautiful glorious thing so he's talking to the church and he's talking to me and you who have been called for good works that's your lamp now five of them were wise and five were foolish just because you're saved doesn't mean you've got wisdom I look back at my life and I think some of the decisions I've made have been some of the most foolish decisions I've made as a born again Christian. Because you are saved and you've given your life to Christ doesn't mean you've been downloaded by the wisdom of God. We're actually told in Proverbs to pursue wisdom. James says, speaking to the church in his letter, if any of you lack wisdom, ask for it and believe you're going to receive it and he's going to give it to you in abundance. 
Why is James writing to a church to ask for wisdom if they lack it? Because many in the church do. And so we are desperately longing to be like the Lord, but he is the wisdom of God and he's the power of God. So if we are to be conformed into his image, we need to be pursuing wisdom. What is wisdom? Some people will say it's knowing the right thing to do at the right time. And you might have heard of the little illustration of, you know, knowing that a tomato is a fruit. That's knowledge. But wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. OK, that's an aspect of wisdom. But actually, wisdom is purely this, having the mind of Christ to think as he thinks. That's why we are told to fix our eyes on Jesus. Why? Because you become what you look at. Why do we spend so much time exalting the name of Jesus? Why did we finish saying he is so great? Because I can't afford for my heart to be fixed on the supernatural stuff, the activity of the kingdom and not the king himself. And so it's a pulling, an intentional realigning to put the main thing, the main thing, which is Jesus Lord over all things. And so wisdom is something to be pursued. In Proverbs, it says that wisdom will make a man's face shine. Now, if you go into Revelation 1 and you see John's account of Jesus, it says that his face shone like the strength of the sun at midday. That's a paraphrase. The brightness of the sun, what is it? Is the very wisdom of God emanating out of his face. Wisdom will make you shine. So if you have this lamp in your hand, it's not just something that you go in, but you carry the very wisdom of the Lord if you're pursuing it and you're asking him to give it to you regularly. That's incredible, isn't it? So we have a picture here of two very different expressions of Christianity. And I believe it's actually a picture of what it looks like to be a carnal Christian and to be a spiritual Christian. And a spiritual Christian is nothing that is not available to the carnal Christians because it is just being led by the spirit of God. That's what makes you a spiritual Christian. And it says that the sons of God in Romans 8 shall be led by the spirit of God. Well, what's a carnal Christian then? Well, it's somebody who professes Christ but doesn't follow the spirit. So what spirit are they following? It's the spirit of the age, the spirit of the prince of the power of the air. And so when we have Christians who will support and promote values that look more like it's been birthed in the realm of hell than it did from the heart of God, you've got to ask, what does your profession actually mean? There are some people who, because they haven't heard the truth of the word and they haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to minister his culture, his kingdom into their hearts, that they're walking around with their eyes closed, thinking they're saved. And one day they might hear what we heard at the end of this parable. Away from me, I never knew you. The Lord is looking to set a fire in our hearts where he burns the world out of us. And you see, you are saved when you give your life. Your spirit man comes alive, but you still every single day are called to surrender your soul to the will of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus modeled it exactly the same, didn't he? I only ever do what I see my father do. I'll only ever say what I hear my father saying. He was the son of God being led by the spirit of God. Romans 8 tells us that the Holy Spirit searches the very depths of the heart of the Father and he reveals the mysteries of the Father to us. Well, how can you hear those mysteries and align with them if you're not sensitive to who he is and what he wants to do? And so I've lived, I'll be honest with you, I've lived the majority of my Christian life as a carnal Christian, loving the benefits of salvation, but still liking the taste of the world. The problem is friendship with the world is an enmity with the Lord. I was only reading uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 4 today. I'll quickly just flip to it. I don't want to hash it up like I normally do. And he says this, and it kind of put the fear of the Lord on me. Where are we? He's talking about, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. You abstain from sexual immorality that each of you should know to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honour, not in passion of lust. It's not just sexual sin, but a lust for the world, lust for wealth, lust for power, lust for influence, lust for affection from the wrong places. You know that stuff. Like the Gentiles who do not know God. You ever met a Christian who you wouldn't know they're a Christian unless they told you? 
I was that person for a long time saying I, I believed one thing, but my actions actually prophesied something completely different. You couldn't decipher me from any of my friends, you know, 15, 10 years ago. The Lord had to do a work in my heart where he separated me for himself. That's holiness right there, to be separated for something. So it goes on that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness set apart to him. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us to his whole, also given us his Holy Spirit. There are Christians rejecting the Lord because they love the world. And they believe that they have given their hearts to him because they to a message that didn't cost them anything. See, the gospel is free. Jesus died for you. You can do nothing to earn the righteousness of Christ, but it's free, but it'll cost you everything. You just got to die every day. So both the devil and God want you dead. That's what baptism's about. The devil wants you dead for eternity. God wants you dead so his life can be live in you. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I've gone into preaching mode. I'm sat down. I'm, I'm messed up. Sorry. Right. Okay. So let's crack on with the story. Wisdom. We're going to be a spiritual people who know the heart of God, who will be led by the spirit of God. Yes. Anyone with me? Right. Amen. So those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So there's a picture here of the wise taking their lamps, their ministries, but they're not taking their oil. Now, the oil in Scripture consistently is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Just think about what oil is actually used. In Psalms, it says, in fact, it wasn't Psalms, it was the Good Samaritan story when, you know, the guy has been beaten up and left for dead. The Samaritan rubbed what into the wounds to bring healing? oil and wine together both pictures of the holy spirit the holy spirit heals our bodies you know he comes and he lubricates our life think about what oil does and he he breaks off those mindsets that cause us to be jarred when we're walking with the lord because he's continually renewing how we think be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you're able to prove the perfect and good and acceptable will of the lord the oil is a picture of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It eases the way for us and massages our life and prepares us for the good works that we have. You ever had a good massage and suddenly realize you can do more than you could ever do? You probably know that. You look like a guy who likes a massage. He's into sports. And so when you have a massage, it frees your muscles, which means that you can be more productive in the things that you do afterwards. Maybe the restrictions that were stopping you being fruitful, the Holy Spirit comes and he massages his life into us that actually sets us free from the restraints that we have. It says, doesn't it, about set aside those weights that hold us back in Hebrews, right? And it's following on from the chapter of faith of this story of what God has done with people who just said yes, who are truly spiritual believers, believing believers that what God says he wants to do, he can do and he will do. And yes, he'll even do it through you. That's the only yes that those people in the Old Testament gave. So you hear about the Abrahams and you hear about the Enochs and the Noahs and the Elijahs and the Elishas and the Jeremiahs who look like failures before the world, but before all of heaven the lord was saying well done good and faithful servant and he ushered them in he said these ones i know these ones i know come in and the holy spirit is able to massage his life into us and so these foolish ones they're taking their lamps and their ministries but they are not taking their intimacy with the lord you see we can see revival in this city and we can see a harvest but you might not know who the lord is I think that whilst the eternal perspective is the return of the Lord that's tied into the harvest, the greatest call that we have is to know the Lord. John 17, 3, that this is, um, oh, what's the word? It's gone right on my head. This is salvation to know the Father and to know his Son. You have been saved. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that none should perish, but you should have eternal life. Sorry, that's John 73, eternal life 
is to know the Father and to know the Son. It's the highest call. Because when you know him, you'll begin to be like him and then you start to act like him. You speak like him. You reveal him wherever you go. But if you are unwise and you are doing the Christian thing that's expected of you, you will sacrifice the cost for intimacy for the lamp, for the ministry to be seen. You see, the danger for this house is this, that we put prize the miracles over the miracle worker. And we're seeing the testimonies come in, but it's a choice every single day. We're going to fix our eyes on the main things, a sign that makes us wonder about him. That's the oil. That's why we worship for so long, because the oil is your most precious commodity. The lamp doesn't actually work without the oil. And when your intimacy runs out, actually, all you've got is just a jake, uh, like a, a, a jar of clay. You've seen the image on the back. It's just this thing that you've got. And the Lord is not impressed by our ministries and our branding and the things that we think we're helping him do. He's only impressed by hearts that open up and say, oh, God, fill me with everything you are. And he goes, oh, that's a jar I can use. That's a jar I can use. We're just fractured jars emanating the life of him. But we have to have that life inside of us. It's the oil of the Holy Spirit, the intimacy with him. It's the union with him in our everyday walks. And you find that the more you prioritize the intimacy with the Lord, the more you start to find miracles happening around you, the more you start to find opportunities, the more you start to be in one place and see, oh, this is an opportunity for the Lord to come in. It's intimacy that fuels everything that you do for the Lord. And you've been called to do mighty exploits, but not apart from the intimacy and the closeness of the Holy Spirit. So the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. This isn't a sinful sleeping. Often the picture of sleeping in scripture is you kind of fell away from the Lord and you were awake in one moment in salvation but now you've grown cold that's not what this and we know that because both the wise and the unwise fell asleep there was a waiting that often you know when you're just waiting for that airplane and you've got like an hour and a half two hour delay you just your head starts nodding off but Song of Solomon says this, when the bride was waiting for Solomon to come, it says, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. I was asleep, but my heart was awake. Remember the garden of the Gethsemane? Jesus took James, John and Peter and he says, stay awake and pray for the hour is near. And he only goes away and prays for an hour and he comes back in the fast asleep and he, he wakes them up and says, couldn't you even stay awake for an hour? And like, no, we will do this time. And he goes off again and prays for an hour. And we know that he's sweating droplets of blood. And then he comes back and he sees them asleep again. He says, oh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But when you have wisdom in your heart, where you prioritize his heart and his mind, which is intimacy with us, though you may be asleep in terms of the tiredness and just the waiting on the Lord, and it might feel like it's getting drowned, but your heart is awake and your heart is anchored in eternity. Your heart is anchored for the clarion call of when Jesus returns. That's the beauty of wisdom is that it always anchors you into truth and expectancy. It's incredible what wisdom does. Just if you're unsure on the benefits of wisdom, it will give you long life. It will give you prosperity and yes, financial prosperity. It will give you healed relationships. It will keep you healthy in your life. So not only will you be healed, but also wisdom leads to divine health. Wisdom is incredible. And if you feel like, well, I don't know anything about it, just read the book of Proverbs and read the promises that God wants to get into your experience. So some people are living with an inferior Christian life. And that is every single one of us, by the way. We need to be absorbed in the book of wisdom so that we can say yes and amen. And the Lord is able to bring us to that. I'm continually being renewed in the way that I think. Wisdom. And so they all slumbered and slept. And then at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. 
go out and meet him. This is incredibly prophetic language that Jesus is talking about. We actually see in 1 Thessalonians again that talking about the return of Jesus, saying that Jesus will return with a loud shout um, and then the, the shout of an archangel will be there and also the blow of a trumpet. Those three things. Now, a Jewish wedding, remember he's using the context of their understanding of a wedding. There are three stages to marriage. The first one is this, the fathers have got to agree a price. Let me tell you, there was a price that was agreed in the realm of the spirit for you, to be married to you. The father of creation, the father of eternity, there was an agreement with the father of lies that actually in order for the debt of sin to be paid, it was going to take a perfect sacrifice. And the father said, I know my son can pay that price. There was an agreement, a dowry, for the marriage of you with Jesus for the rest of eternity. And what the father of lies thought was, oh, actually, well, death is death, but didn't realize, and it actually says in the scriptures, doesn't it, that if Satan knew what was on the other side of the cross, he would have never crucified him because he didn't understand, he didn't get the revelation that a perfect sacrifice death could not keep hold of. Death or where is your sting? It has been defeated through purity. And if you have any area of your life that smells like death, pursue purity in your heart. Oh, God, make me pure. Cause my conscience to be cleansed. And we're going to do this at the end by taking communion together. So the first part is there's a dowry, an agreement made between two fathers. We've seen that in our own lives. The second part of a Jewish wedding, they still do this, is the betrothal. And this is what we would call the engagement. But actually, it was a moment of covenant between the boy and the girl we have made a covenant with the lord that when you say yes to the lord that i choose to die and then i choose to go into the waters of baptism it is a covenantal act you make a promise to the lord to no longer live for yourself but to live in and as him and he promises to empower you to live the life that he's called you to do that's the divine exchange of salvation, that no longer do you need to strive or to be bound by rules and regulations and restrictions, but he is able to, we let that go and come through the blood and the cross and go through the waters of baptism. We can then be raised up into a life of freedom and abundance and joy and peace. It's a beautiful covenant, a contract, an agreement between two people. And then actually the groom would then go away. Now imagine that. I proposed to Lauren at Christmas time a few years ago. Uh, imagine if she didn't see me for a year. But that's what they used to do. They used to go away for up to a year and the bride wouldn't know when the groom was going to come back. So she's got this agreement with the groom, but she's then there waiting. Well, what is the groom doing? He's preparing a place. So remember Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you. It's bridal language. He's talking about his coming return. So right now he is preparing, sort of, uh, sort of parabolically preparing a place for you to come. And in the natural, what would happen is, is that the son would go back to his mom and dad's house and they, he would literally build an extension on the back of his house. So that's why it could take up to a year. And if it was me, you'd never have a house, Lauren. We would have, we'd still be waiting. I've got no manual labor skills in the slightest. Look at my hands. Um, that actually plaster is from me doing the gardening yesterday. So it's a war wound that I'm very proud of. And so the groom in the natural would go away. He would build literally on the back of the house and then they would come back and it would be announced with a great shout and a blowing of a trumpet. And suddenly the bride would know my day has come that's the picture of the wedding she didn't know the bride of christ does not know but they do know it will happen and they join with the spirit according to revelation 22 and the spirit and the bride say come it needs to be a heart bursting cry where we go i don't want to live another day without seeing you rightly and without seeing you fully i long to see you for who you are and unless you are the wise bride you'll never pray like that because intimacy won't be a high value for you and when you get to heaven the raisins of the dead that we will experience will not be the stuff that we will be fixed on can we see the replay 
I want to see what happened or the the limbs growing or the eyes being reformed or all of the stuff that we know we're going to see in this city. None of that will be the forefront of our minds. It will be he is more beautiful than I could have ever have imagined. I remember when Lauren walked down the aisle, the first note of the song, you were there, first note of the song, I sobbed. I looked like an absolute mess. And I didn't think I was going to cry. But there is something that is in the heart of marriage where it pulls something out of you that you didn't even realise was in you. I knew I loved it, but I didn't realise that just the first note of the wedding song, this is it. This is the moment. This is what we're going to experience as the church. So then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Now, this is a tradition uh, that they would do, well, a practice more than a tradition, where if you didn't trim the wick of your lamp that was burning, it would actually create a smoky flame that was just very distorted. It would be an unclean fire. And so what you would do is that you would trim it so you get a perfect flame shape and it's perfect perfect flame colour and it doesn't have any black or grey smoke coming off it and it's a picture of preparation and alignment you know as we align with the Lord in his word and by pursuing intimacy by learning to hear his voice making space for him to lead us your flame will shine brightly so you've been called to carry these these uh these flames wherever you are on the top of the hill of a mountain or, or top of the hill of a city but you can have a dusky flame or you can have a flame that shines really bright what gives you that bright flame it is the pruning of the lord it's the being discipled by the lord and so our commission isn't to go get people saved that's not what jesus said jesus said go make disciples of nations disciples is coming from the same word as discipline so to be disciplined by the Lord means that is you acting below your potential and your identity. I want you to think like this. And then he sets them on a new path. And we see this, don't we, with James and John when they uh, are moaning about the Samaritans, not letting them pass through. And they think it's a good idea to say to Jesus, should we call fire down on them? I mean, love the faith. I mean, I don't know about you, if there's, you know, Port Vale, for example, football stadiums on, you're not calling down fire thinking that God can actually do it. But James and John have been around Jesus so much that they knew that fire literally could come down and consume that Samaritan village. But what did Jesus say? He said, oh, you do not know what spirit you are of. John, who was rebuked by the Lord, and it was a rebuke, came to be known as the apostle of love. He was one of the sons of thunder, the the. I don't know, the, the radical bull in a china shop type guy who just said what he said. It didn't matter who he hurt. He was that guy, but the Lord just massaged his heart so perfectly and pruned him. He became known as the apostle of love, the one who rested his head against the chest of the Lord. In fact, he wouldn't even say it. He just said, oh, there was one who rested. And so there is something about this, this journeying in the Lord that we have to embrace the discipline of the Lord. You can't be a child of God and not be disciplined. And it tells us in scripture, doesn't it, that actually a good father disciplines his children. And we've got a picture of discipline where you've been beaten with a rod or you are um, undermined or you are quashed down. But true discipline of the Lord raises you up to where you should have always have been. That's the point is the word of the Lord lifting you up out of the miry clay and setting your feet on a sure foundation of truth and truth will always propel you into fruitfulness but it doesn't stop there john 15 tells us that if you're fruitful you're also going to get pruned so we have to commit to this life of discipline of the holy spirit and so they got up and they trimmed their wick are we good we will be landing and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, no, lest there, be should, lest there should be enough for us, not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. I love impartation. I've had hands laid on me by some incredible men and women of God who I, I look to and I go, oh, Lord, I, I, I want to be as fruitful as those types of people. And uh, we've all got heroes of the faith. And um, 
the reality is is that uh, those people who line up to the Benny Hins and the, the Bill Johnsons, whoever your hero of faith is and say, I want double portion. The reality is, is so do they. They also want a double portion of what they've got. And you see, when you get your, uh, when you have hands laid on you by a minister saying, I'm going to release what I have onto you, uh, it is only ever in seed form. So Paul said to Timothy, fan into flame the gift that was given at the laying on of hands. There was a responsibility of Timothy to do with what was given to him, to seek and then separate myself to the Lord. Any fruitful ministry, you look, any hero of the faith, they will all say that intimacy with the Lord was what fueled it. And the sad tragedy is, is that people start off in intimacy, in wisdom, and they lose the sight of the main thing. They become enamored with the shiny, miraculous, shiny success, shiny notoriety, the shiny praise of man. And they set their eyes on the wrong thing and they forget actually what fueled the lamp in the first place was my intimacy with the Lord. Can you see somebody raised from the dead and they go straight into the prayer closet and say, oh, Jesus, I love you. Oh, I worship you. Or are you going to be mapping out your new book on how to raise the dead? That's what people do. Open the door. <laughs> Knock and they will answer. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Fasting. We should do nothing because out of legalism. But I truly believe in the, the call to fast. Jesus said to the disciples that when they were challenged, well, why aren't they fasting like John's disciples? And he said, well, why would they fast when the bridegroom's with them? But when he goes, then they will fast. What is fasting? It's not what most people do, which is a hunger strike. If you don't give me this, I'm not going to eat. That's what a lot of people's fasts are. It's about getting something. Actually, fasting is never about getting something. Fasting is about giving something, which is space to the Lord. And in the process of that, you're crucifying the flesh, the appetites of the flesh. And so fasting is the creating space for him to come. It's a very intentional act of intimacy with the Lord. And yet it's a really powerful one. Because remember when they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James and John, and they're coming down, they're hearing of a boy who's been thrown into the fire in the water by the, the, the demonization that was happening. And they came to him and said, why can't we cast this out? And the dad's like, why can't they cast out? You're not taught. And they said, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. Well, Jesus just come down from the mountain. He didn't have time to go away and do a fast and then come back. When did he do his fast? Immediately after his baptism. So what's it telling us? Be ready in season, out of season. So developing a lifestyle of intimacy is actually going to be breakthrough for somebody when you least expect it. So what if tomorrow you're going down the road and somebody dies in a car accident three, four cars up? Do you have such faith and connection with the heart of God to go over to that car wreckage and bring life back to them? Or do we go, oh, that looks a bit bad. I know where Jesus would be. He'd be leaning through the window, sticking hands on before the ambulance got there. It might be though, just to get breath into them. You know, let them recover in hospital if that's what they want to do. But fasting and prayer and intimacy keeps you alert to the kingdom of God breaking out. Tomorrow, some of you are going to have situations, opportunities to release the life of Jesus. And if your intimacy is connected in, you'll be able to seize it. If it's not, because we're busy and distracted, we can miss those opportunities. We all do it every single day. So that's their intimacy. So. But the wise answers say, no, lest there should not be enough for us, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. You know, when Jesus returns and all of creation will be aware of it. You've seen those like memes, haven't you, where somebody's clothes is at the bottom of the stairs and go, oh, mum's been raptured. Where, where, where was Jesus? You're never going to miss it. Literally, the sky is going to be ripped open and Jesus is going to return in the same way they left. How do we know that? Because when Jesus ascended in front of the disciples, they were doing this like we all would. Not only was it 
marvellous enough to think that we saw, we know he died on the cross and then he turns up three days later and he's eating fish with us by the lake and he's talking with us and even poor Tommy's got to stick his fingers in the wounds. I mean, that's mind blowing a lot, but you know, 40 days later, he's uh, talking, uh, where, where are you going? Uh, it's gone up to heaven, but then it says, two like, dazzling men in white, angels said, what are you doing? You need to get to Jerusalem. He is gonna come back the same way that you saw him leave. Jesus is going to return. Everybody's going to know he has come. The thing is, it might be when we've got a church service on. I wonder how many people hit the floor face down, trying to then nurture intimacy because suddenly they realise I'm now before the Lord. When actually we should be doing it as a lifestyle. You know, I don't know if you ever get on your face at home. Let me encourage you, there is no lower place than the floor. And just saying, Jesus, I, I, even with my body, I submit to you. And as a prayer for Presence Church, we go, away, even after the, the great stories, we continually say, oh, Jesus, we give this right back to you. We yield it back on the altar because this doesn't belong to us. You said you would build your church, not Luke, Lauren, Paul, Donna, whoever it is. You know, Josh, none of us have been called to build the church. We've been called to obedience. Obedience is our responsibility. Outcomes is his fruitfulness is his and so i don't want us to be a people who get enamored by the benefits of the kingdom and not be so absorbed with the king himself and the reality is is that for some it will be too late that they breathe their last and they put a price a value on something that wasn't actually worth anything you know i know of people Believers who just want a nice, normal, quiet life. And you chose the wrong saviour. You see, when we get saved, we don't just say, I want a saviour for my sins. You actually invite a Lord to come. What do lords do? They lord it over you. That means he has every right, every aspect of your life. You literally do not belong to yourself anymore. You are now a slave of Christ. You have no ownership of your life whatsoever. Me neither. And so intimacy, the beauty is that he doesn't abuse it. He draws us in in love, draws us in intimacy, reveals his heart to us, all for the purpose that we would then go out and reveal him to the world. That's incredible. It's beautiful. So afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. That word know there is, I did not experientially know you and you didn't know me. You, you had the badge, but you never had the heart. The two are very close to each other. And actually, we need to have discernment in these days where the Christian message is so mixed and so watered down that we need to be able to have eyes to see who truly is redeemed and who is under a lie. Because when the veils truly lift off, they'll give everything to him because he gave everything for us. You see carnal Christianity around us, even in this house, we call it out. We do it in love, this discipline. We have to shape each other. We have to be committed as a family of God. And we know what it's like, don't we, when we've got that one family member where they walk into the room and the atmosphere changes and you just know something ain't right about that one. We know there's some secret life going on. We've, we've all known family members like that, right? They just change the atmosphere. How about we have such a pure people built up in the image of Christ that as soon as somebody who professes his name, we immediately know a counterfeit when we see it because we've been so around the pure and the authentic, the yielded, the laid down, the intimate with the Lord. I believe that's what he's looking for. And it will be for the salvation of their souls that they can truly come to the altar of the Lord and truly meet a Lord who desires them, who died for them, who wants to see them fruitful. And I just pray that there will be a move of God in this city, that even people sat in churches who think that they are redeemed. I pray that we would be a generation who reaches them, that they come into the true gospel, where they see the true power of a redeemed life, that it also is a laid down life. We need to, because if we love them, we will be praying that. Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. 
Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. You know, Jesus even said when he was pressed on it, when's all these things going to happen? And he says, only the Father knows. Oh, that Peter said that God is not slow as man thinks slow, but the purpose of it is that God desires that none should perish. In other words, his return is being delayed because there's still a window of grace that's open for people to come into newness of life, to be redeemed, to be saved, to be set free. And the thing is, the gifts of the Spirit have no benefit in heaven whatsoever. You don't need a gift of healing because everyone's healed, but new bodies. You don't need a prophetic word because it says, doesn't it, about prophecy, it's just like looking into a dim mirror. We see in part, we prophesy in part. You're going to get to see him right in front of you as the disciples did but in all of its glory like john saw in revelation one the gifts mean nothing in heaven they're just vehicles to reveal the love of god through faith for what purpose to reach people who need to know him and see him the gifts are god's way of showing off and demonstrating his goodness because it's the goodness of god that leads to repentance but if we are going to be that people we need to be so fueled in our flasks in our clay jars that we need to have the oil of intimacy fuel. And if you hear one thing from me, the miracles don't matter if there's no intimacy. But if you have intimacy, you'll have all the miracles you ever desire to see. And it's not wrong for you to desire for the miraculous and the raising of the dead. Only God's heartbeat can give that passion for you. But the way to reach it is to invest in your intimacy with the Lord. Get in the word, create space. Every single time you walk in a shop, it's possible. Dial in on the Lord. Lord are you going to do anything here? Cause me to be sensitive in this moment. Cause my eyes to be open that I can see an opportunity for your love to reach someone who desperately needs. And as we pray those very childlike prayers, you will see the spirit of God lead you because you're a child of God. Wow. And so I want to give you a tool right here. I know that Paul and Donna do this, myself and Lauren do this very regularly together. We're going to spend some time and just do communion together. And Paul's going to leave us with a blessing at the end. But I really hope you're capturing the heart of eternity. I really do. Because what the Lord wants to do in this city, you just cannot comprehend. You don't have to do anything more. You don't have to try and make something happen. You just yield to the work of grace in your life. You yield to the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you and you get the beautiful benefit of knowing him, eternal life. So I think it's on the board, Hebrews 10. I'm going to come into it. Has everyone got a communion cup? Anyone not? Thanks, Josh. Anyone want to be a wise virgin? <laughs> sure do. Ah, to think like him. Got that first verse, Lauren. So this is the process of intimacy right here. There is nothing more intimate than coming around the table of the Lord to partake in the blood that was shed for us to eat of the flesh but hung on a tree and cursed is the one who hung on a tree so that we didn't ever have to be cursed what's a curse not witches and covens capped blessing the geyser of blessing breaks off when we come into the reality of the blood and the flesh of jesus and so a lifestyle of intimacy starts at the table and so he says in Hebrews 10, verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated through us, for us through the veil that is his flesh. The blood of Jesus has given us confidence to come in for that intimacy tonight. How do we step in? We step into his body. We are the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. As that veil tore from top to bottom when he died, it was because his body was torn on a cross. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, 
having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That's like the memory of sin and patterns and thinking, well, I'm only human. Now that's going tonight. You're going to be renewed in the way that you think. You're going to think as Christ sees you, which is pure, blameless and spotless. And our bodies washed with pure water. That's the word. We've been having that tonight. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. We've just gone in that scripture. We've gone beyond the veil and it's a picture of the the priests in the old temple where when you went beyond the veil, you came into the Holy of Holies. It was where the manifest presence of God resided over the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. But there isn't a box anymore that we have to look to. We can actually go to what the box was representing, that what the temple was representing, which is heavenly places, that we can actually go beyond the veil, breaking out from the limitations of this realm that we can taste, touch, see, and we can actually connect with one though who is invisible. We believe he is who he says that he is, and the eyes of our heart are opened, and we get to see what is real. Paul said that that realm is more real than this one that we can touch, taste, see, hear, smell. So we're going to go in holding fast the confession of our hope that Jesus is my saviour. He is my Lord. He's called me in for intimacy. That's your confession of hope, the joyful expectation, the goodness of God. And I will not allow any circumstance, any situation to cause my hope in the assurance that I am in the very palm of his hands, that I am the apple of his eye. I will never waver when I fix my eyes on what Jesus did for me. You can go through any storm and you will stand firm in the knowledge Knowledge that Jesus and you are one together, that you are his body in him, living through him. And let us consider then, this is our ministries, the way that we live. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. When? so much more as you see the day approaching. We started off with Matthew 25. We end off back here again. We are going to encourage each other more and more, discipline each other, discipline each other in wisdom, in the way that we should be living fruitful. So what? That Jesus, when he does return, that day of approaching, he will receive everything that he paid the price for. Isn't that a life worth living? A life worth laying down to live? And so let's just thank Jesus for the blood and the flesh. Jesus, I want to thank you for the blood that you shed for the remission of our sins. I thank you that the power of the blood goes beyond from ridding us of the sins and the consequence of sin, but cleanses our consciences. I pray, Father, we will be white as snow and how we think and how we feel. We pray, Father, for an alignment of our awareness of who you are with the truth. Father, we just rebuke as well right now, just for someone in the room, we rebuke the lie that your experience is who God is. And what happens is that we can go through negative experiences and we make conclusions about the character and nature of who Jesus is. Those limitations are breaking off. We break that limited blessing, that curse, and we release you into the fullness of the life of the blood. For there is life in the blood, says Leviticus. So Jesus, we thank you for the blood. And Father, we thank you as well that you sent your son, that though he was beaten and bruised beyond recognition, it was the ultimate act of love. For there is no greater love than this, than the man who will lay down his life for his friends. I thank you that you hung on a tree as a curse for us. I thank you not, not only did you die in the flesh for us, but you died as us. I thank you, Jesus, that your body did not rot in the grave, but it was resurrected again in the most beautiful, glorious, eternal life. And we just declare, King Jesus, that as for me and this household, we will be the body of Christ who will manifest the fullness of the head, who is our Lord King Jesus. And the house of God said, Amen. Thank you, Lord. And we just pray bodies would just be healed right now as you take this flesh and blood. 
It says, if you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you'll have eternal life and you'll be raised up. Eternal life is the life of the Father flowing from his heart into yours. He has no sickness, so be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You got a blessing for us? Awesome. Shall we all just stand? Um, amen. Thank you all. Yeah, we're just going to pray a blessing on you. Um, if you want to turn to your neighbour and just give him a hug. That is a joke. I'm joking. <laughs> you can do it if you want. Someone needed a hug. But yeah, um, yeah, we just, we're just just going to pray a blessing over you before you leave uh, and go into the week. So yeah, if you want to lift your hands, you can lift your hands. You can hold your hands out and receive. Yeah, Father God, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done tonight and us, through us, for us. And Lord, as each one steps out right now as they go back into the homes and the, the workplaces, the schools, wherever they go, we thank you, Lord, that your spirit is in them and it goes with them. Thank you, Lord, that every place that they go, it's just as if Jesus has stepped into the room. So I, I declare favour upon the people. I thank you, Lord, for your love, a greater revelation of the love of God for this week. And Lord, it says that I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health, even as your soul prospers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.